And now it's time for Answers with Eric. Hello, and we get straight to it today. Know a little bit of fun at the beginning. Today we're considering Acts chapter 15, verses 27 through 41. Um, it's a conclusion to what we've already started. We're picking up in the, at the tail end of this council in Jerusalem where they have settled the great debate, a great big, you know, just clash of the titans. You know, are we going to circumcise or not circumcise? And so anyhow, they've answered that debate about circumcises and decided they've decided that the Gentiles are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as the Jews are. So we're all saved by grace uh, through our faith. Uh, but the church not only had and has theological debates and theological issues, there are also personal ones. Um, just as we will see today, as the inseparable duo, Paul and Barnabas, well, they have a sharp dispute and instead of being inseparable, they actually separate. So now on to the questions. Uh, first of all, in regards to a review, who wrote the letter, and that's according to verse number 23 of chapter 15, uh, the apostles and the brethren who are elders, and, and that is referencing them in Jerusalem. What was the occasion for the writing? And as it says in verses 24 and 25, since we have heard, and this is part of the letter, since we have heard that some of our number to whom we gave no instruction have, dis have disturbed you with their words unsettling your souls it seemed good to us having become of one mind to select men to send to you uh, with our beloved Barnabas and Paul so they're settling this dispute dispute making sure that uh, what has come from Jerusalem is known to be true that uh, people are saved by grace not by circumcision uh, now to verse 27 this is our first uh, verse to consider uh, says, what are Judas and Silas to do? And um, so in verse 27 says, Therefore we have sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will also report the same things by word of mouth. So they're there just to confirm the words of the letter. How has the Holy Spirit been involved with the in the decision? Um, and in the verse itself, it says, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. So the, the first uh, consideration is actually the Holy Spirit making this decision that the Gentiles are saved by grace. But it goes all the way back to what we've studied already in chapter 15 that was part of the debate. First of all, in verse 8, um, there it indicates that the Holy Spirit had shown his approval of Cornelius and all the uh, Gentiles in his house. And that was per the words of Peter. And then in verse 15, um, we see there, verse 15, it says, with, with the words, and this with the words of the prophets agree. So the words of the prophets, you know, those are and actually words of the Holy Spirit again. And the, Holy, the prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit confirmed the same things as he moved the prophets to speak. And then that quotation uh, was following in verses 16 through 18. Question for verse 29. It says, um, fill in the blank. You got to love this, right? These are easy. So, and this is something that was already stated, and there is one little bit of a difference. But it says the, en the essentials are this uh, to abstain from things sacrificed to idols, to abstain from blood and things strangled, and fornication. So now it is interesting that, that fornication here was put last. I don't think it was um, put last in the first the first list. Verse number twenty had said, but we write to, but that we should write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication, and from what is strangled and from blood. So the order is mixed up just a little bit. Fornication is put last, and it's the one that is always certainly going to be true. Um, and these other ones are more. Uh, Toward, geared towards the you know meeting the requirements of the law um, the things um, sacrificed to idols actually you notice in the the original passage verse 20 it said things contaminated or the pollutions of idols so that 
specifically comes about when they write it, they are talking about things that have been sacrificed to idols. So it becomes very pointed towards the fact that they're talking about food. So, um, so food that has been, you know, as a sacrifice to an idol, blood, that's another thing related to food, food laws, um, strangled things, that's another food law. And then fornication is, you know, so many of their um, uh, pagan rituals related to just, uh, just terrible fornication practices, you know, sexual practices that were outside of the, the realm of what God had designed uh, sex, sexual activity for. So a man want, one man, one woman for life, that is where the sexual activity is to be held and, um, and uplifted and, and celebrated. Um, anything outside of that is fornication. Now, the question comes, we want to remember this, why had James said these things were required? And I want to point this out because this is, this is an important point. It's not, he doesn't say this is required by Christ. He says in verse 21, it says, For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him, since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So it's a, I, and I hear that as just basically saying, you know, hey, there, there's Jews all around you. You got to do these things and, and submit to these things so that you just won't be absolutely repulsive to the Jews. And another question in regard to verse 29, it says, do you think it is wrong to eat food sacrificed to idols? So here's that question, and I guess you could apply it to blood. Do you think it's wrong to drink blood? Do you think it's a sin to eat something that's been strangled? Um, so those questions are, are all related, but we do have an, a scriptural answer to the thing, the idea of the things to eat food that has been polluted by idols. Well, um, the answer is yes. It would be wrong and the answer is no it wouldn't be wrong so it's a, it's an either-or question it depends upon the circumstances and 1st Corinthians uh, bears this out um, in 1st Corinthians chapter 8 verses 4 through 9 it says therefore concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world and that there is no God but one uh, for even if there are so-called idols, blah, 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 yet for there is, there is one God. Um, in verse 7, however, not all men have this knowledge, but some being accustomed to the idol until now eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled, but food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. But take care of this liberty of yours. If be, take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block, block to the weak. Um, and, um, and he ends in verse 13. I'll add that to you. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. So, uh, you know, an idol is nothing. You know, if, the, if they buy food in a market that came from a sacrifice to an idol, they're... You know, Paul's telling them, just eat it. It's no big deal. Unless it causes somebody else some problems. Then don't eat it at all. Never eat meat again. You know, it should be, we should always be considerate uh, towards, towards our brethren and towards what others will view us as. And we sure don't want people you know, looking at us and saying, well, he claimed to be a Christian, but he's, eating, he's actually a pagan. He believes in other gods because he's eating the, the meat sacrificed. To an idol so you know just be careful so is there is it wrong to eat food sacrificed to idols in and of itself no but if it's perceived in a different way by somebody else then it would be wrong don't eat it and I think there are you know and perhaps that'd be a good discussion for us sometime is what what things are like that are there you know, we don't have food sacrificed to idols in our culture now but would there be things that this principle would apply to? That's something to consider. Uh, and the next question is verse 30. It says, uh, where did they take the letter? And this church, you can read that verse. They're ta it's taken to the brethren. It's shared with the, the people, the assembly in Antioch. Um, verse 31, how did they respond to the letter? And did they view the requirements as a heavy yoke to bear? So these four things. What, what happened? Well, you can read there, and it, 
they rejoiced. It was not a burden, but an encouragement. Um, and the, the literal language of that for it, they, they were encouraged by it. You know, they were, they were encouraged. It's literally, they were encouraged by it. They received, well, I've got to read it now. Verse number 31. Ah, I'm still in 1 Corinthians. Here we go. 31. Um, when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. So they rejoiced because of its exhortation. Um, so it's, you know, in this idea of exhortation, I exhort you, you know, it's always a do something. So the exhortation that they received is to um, not do these three things and not commit fornication. And they rejoiced in that encouragement. They were, they were like, yeah, that's, that's good. We can handle this. This is great. You know, so that's, uh, th those were the requirements that were put on them and they were very happy about that. So they rejoiced because of what they were, how they were called to act on the behalf of Jesus. 33, uh, 32 and 33 has the question uh, put together here. What did Judas and Silas do in Antioch and how were they sent away? So these were the two guys who were sent to confirm the letter. These were probably two very Jewish guys, Judas and Silas. And actually Silas is not a, a, a Jewish name, I don't believe. So, so maybe he was a Greek convert that was a, a big figure, an important person in Jerusalem. And how were they then sent away? Um, so Judas and Silas being prophets themselves, um, excuse me, verse, verse 32. Um, oh yeah, this is, this is right. I was skipping. I was thinking like it was the previous verse. Judas and Silas also being prophets themselves encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. So that's what, you know, they give this lengthy message. They're going on and on encouraging the brothers. It's a very... Very good one for the believers, encouraging them, giving, exhorting them, strengthening them. And then after they had spent some time there, they were sent away from the brethren in peace. And they were sent back to um, the, the ones that had sent them out. Uh, so it's just that, that thought they were encouraged by them and they sent them on their way, probably with hugs and kisses, sent them on in peace. And we thank you for coming. You've served your purpose well and you can go on your way. Thanks for being here with us. Verse 34, the question says, but what did Silas do? Um, in here it says that Silas, um, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. So Silas stays. He likes what's happening in, in Jerusalem. In, excuse me. He's left the church, in, the strong church in Jerusalem. He is going to stay with the strong church that is very Gentile in nature up in Antioch. Uh, verses 35 and 36, the question is, who else stayed and what did they do? So, it also, the verse, it's kind of funny that it even indicates this, but it says, but Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch. We expected them to, in my opinion, but anyhow. And they're teaching and preaching with many others also the word of the Lord. So, they're, they're teaching and preaching. And then, according to verse 36, they decide, they they're there for some time after some days. Who knows how long that might have been. Um, so they decided to go back and check on the brethren that they had converted on their first missionary journey. So uh, they're very concerned. You know, it's, they, they love these folks. They went through great lengths on that first missionary journey. You think about all the hardships that they endured. And we then after they'd been to these places and all the hardships that they had, they turned around and went back to them to come back home. And it seems like things went well on that return trip. Uh, they didn't get stoned again in any, in any, at any rate. Um, so now they're deciding to go back to those places. These guys are fearless and they are devoted. Devoted to the Word of God and devoted to the church. Uh, verse 37, it says, What is the relationship between Barnabas and John Mark? Um, and there's, there's a cross-reference here to Colossians chapter 4.10. And um, Barnabas, in, the, in this particular passage, you see um, Barnabas, you know, he's sticking up for John Mark. Uh, and you, if you go to Colossians 4.10, I think we mentioned this before in the previous, um, when we studied this earlier about John Mark. Um, these two are cousins, you know, and it, that's indicated in Colossians 4.10. So this makes sense that that Barnabas would have a certain, a greater affection um, towards John Mark, and he would stick up for John Mark, and he's, you know, he's family. I want to see him growing. I want him, he, 
you know, even if he's made a mistake, he can recover from it. You know, he can he can do good. So he's he's really um, he's really pulling for John Mark. Wants him involved. Um, question for thirty eight says, why did Paul not want John Mark to come? And you know, this this passage is very clear. It wasn't in the earlier passage when it indicated that you know John Mark went back to Jerusalem. It didn't say have any strong words of condemnation there, but here. Here, Paul doesn't want John Mark to come along because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. So we needed him. We had work to do, and he just gave up. He just left us and didn't, didn't fulfill the work that we were, that we were called to. Uh, verse 39, it says, Did they resolve this dispute, and where did Barnabas and Mark go? So, the scripture here indicates that it was a sharp dispute. It doesn't it doesn't say, well, they came to the conclusion that maybe they should just separate ways. It says there's a sharp dispute and it caused them to separate. So Barnabas and Mark, then they go back to Barnabas' home, homeland, home place, and where Mark would also have family too then. Uh, they sail to the island of Cyprus. And what did Paul do for question for 40? Um, and what did the brethren do? So Paul chose Silas. So chapter 15 is where we were first introduced to Silas. And now he's going to become a major, you know, it's it, it, all through the book of Acts. It seems like everybody who becomes an important um, figure, he's introduced before we get to the, to the important role that he's going to play. So the same thing happens with, with Silas that's happened with other folks. He was introduced... Um, in, uh, in chapter 15, and it was actually verse number 22, at the end of verse number 22, it says, Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. Leading men among the brethren. So these are important men, very capable. We saw them, they are prophets, as indicated in this reading, that are able to speak and exhort well and do a good job at that. So Paul chooses Silas. And then the church, what did the brethren do? The church committed them to the grace of the Lord. You know, as they're going out, you know, we send you out. And the ones uh, earlier, um, Judas was sent back in peace. Um, now here they are as they get ready to go out to do this work. They're sent in the grace of God. Going back into the lion's den, may the grace of God be with you. May he watch over you. May he protect you. May he keep you in his love and in his care. May he do for you all that, all that he can do you know, to bless your, your journey. 41 says, uh, where do Paul and Silas go? They head north uh, through Syria, um, according to this verse, and then they head west into Cilicia. And that would be getting into the, uh, the peninsula of Asia Minor, as we would call it. So, and, and as you look, if you look on a map, and we'll get into a map when we start the next lesson, um, but Paul's, Paul's hometown of Tarsus is located in Cilicia. That's where um, Paul was there when in, Cilic in Cilicia, in Tarsus particularly, at his hometown, when Barnabas was actually in Antioch and saw this great work going on, and then Barnabas went to Tarsus, brought back Paul, and that's where everything began. Now these two that, you know, Barnabas had uh, kind of mentored and grabbed hold of Paul and made him into the, to the man he was, and now they parted ways. But hey, don't worry about it. You can read out, read through the rest of the, the good book, and it seems like they have, have reconciled. They are not going to hold a grudge. They had a personal difference, and it sent them in different directions and actually probably ended up multiplying the work, and they probably laugh about it later and rejoice that God did what he did. And even Paul um, refers to John Mark affectionately later and, and speaks well of him. So Paul Barnabas gives John Mark that second chance, that grace that he needed, and it, and it works out well to the glory of God. And so now Paul and Silas, we got two teams going out instead of one. And Paul and Silas, they're going and strengthening the church on the way as they go. So, yeah, the, the church had issues theologically, had issues with personal, personal issues that got in the way. 
Uh, but by the grace of the God, the, the church made its way through it. And the same can be true today. The church can thrive and we just need to focus on what we need to do. And we need to be, to be strong and courageous and act in every way that we can for the Lord. May you do that today. May you be encouraged by, by Paul and all these folks that we read about. They were devoted to the work of the Lord. So be strong and courageous and act.